Greetings, folks. My name is Dustin Cormier. This is How to Rock Astrology. Today we're going to be continuing our reading of Anuradha Nakshatra's deity. And that is, of course, the deity Mitra. Uh, the information that we are getting in this podcast is coming from the divine forces of the lunar nakshatras as portrayed in the Vedas by an author that goes by the name of Radha. She is a researcher, professionally trained in Ayurveda and Jyotisha. Uh, of course, if you're watching, you'd probably know that this is a... I'm a tropical Vedic astrologer. So the work that we're reading here by Radha is based on the works of someone who practices sidereal Vedic astrology. Uh, which means a lot of the times there's often correlations in this book of the nakshatras to sidereal rashis, to sidereal signs, which as a neo-Vedic practitioner, as a tropical Vedic practitioner, I don't really practice that. So it's, some, it's a caveat I always have to give whenever I read from a book like this. Now, I, st I love this author. I love the great, incredible research that she's done in all these ancient Vedic shastras and uh, Jyotish shastras and stotras. So what I have been doing with this series is just going through her work, and whenever I see something that has that connotation, I'll mention it. But ultimately, you've heard it from the beginning here. So when we read it, you know, we can just take it for what it is. Ultimately, let's remember that the nakshatras are a sidereal phenomenon that has nothing to do with the rashis, with the signs, according to the tropical Vedic tradition. Which means that the sidereal nakshatras are the same. So when this author is talking about the sidereal nakshatra of Mitra, whether she is a sidereal Rashi user or tropical Rashi user, it's still about the same nakshatra, the same sidereal portion of Anuradha nakshatra. So that only took two and a half minutes. <laughs> I'm getting used to the language of describing these things, but I digress. So that is what we're going through today. This is a continuation of our nakshatras series. Of course, Mitra is often combined together, and this chapter in this book is a com combined reading of Mitra and Varuna, which rules the deity that rules Shatabishak Nakshatra. So, the beginning especially is more focused on, uh, this little introduction at least, describes Mitra Vayuna, Mitra Varuna as a sort of combined entity. And then it goes into just describing Mitra. And then we'll get more into Shatabishak when we get to Shatabishak's nakshatra, when we're to be discussing Varuna. So let's begin. This is chapter 12 of this book. This is Mitra and Varuna, a match made in heaven. We hear a quote from the Rig Veda, book 8, verse 25. Or chapter 25. The great Aditi gives birth to these two, Mitra and Varuna, who are possessed of all affluence. They shine with great splendor for their supreme sway. The two great lords of cosmic light, Mitra, and water vapors, Varuna, are sovereign rulers and powerful divines. They are true to eternal laws and proclaimers of our sacred work. Again, that's Rig, Vod Rig Veda Mandala 8, chapter 25. So the first heading is the introduction to these two. And we read that Mitra is verily, rarely invoked in the Rig Veda without his compatriot Varuna. Yet these two godheads are as opposite as day and night. Benevolent, kind, and loving, Mitra is likened to the glorious morning sun. And I believe it's an Aditi that correlates with that early morning. Now, unforgiving and formidable, 
Varuna is associated with the dark, foreboding nighttime sun. Mitra Puta Daksha, pure minded, is what that translates to. The epitome of right alliances is concerned with peaceful and fair relationships. Varuna Rishadas, the destroyer of enemies, is the intolerant judge overseeing law enforcement and regulation. Now, these words Putadaksha, given to Mitra, and Rishadas, the destroyer of enemies, given to Varuna, both of those are kind of quotes that come from the secret of the Veda by Sri Aurobindo. It's a book I've been going through a little bit. It's a little tough read, <clears throat> but it's given as a footnote. That's where that reference comes from. The, mag the magnificence of each of these deities is best appreciated in light of the other. Hence, their individual characterizations are presented first in this chapter, and then eventually there is a depiction of both of them as Maitra Varuna. A harmonious blending of these complementary godheads is presented closer to the end. Varuna's other close comrade is Indra, a devata equal in force, strength, and nobility. Without a doubt, these two are the toughest dudes in town, Varuna and Indra, Shatabishak and Jesta Nakshatras. Together, these two maintain order and justice in the world. And this quote coming from the Rig Veda Mandala 7 says, O Indra Varuna, mighty and very rich, one of you is called monarch, Indra, and one autocrat, Varuna. All gods in the most lofty region of the air have, O ye steers, combined all power and might in you. So Rig Veda Mandala 7, chapter 82. In recognition of their importance as universal forces, a section on their friendship is included in this chapter. And we'll probably get more into that when we get into Varuna in the Shatabishak chapter. That's going to be a long one. Now we read first about Putadaksha, the pure minded Mitra. Mitra, friend and ally, and Aryaman, which somewhat translates to companion. Aryaman is the ruler of Purva Falguni. Both of these, Mitra and Aryaman, represent notions of close friendship. But unlike Aryaman, whose domain is familial relationships, Mitra's influence is all encompassing. For example, in the Agnistoma, the one day Soma Yagna, Mitra is invoked. Come as a friend, Mitra, to us creating firm friendships. I believe that's the TS is the Taitariya Samhita. Such an amiable devata is best known for his faculty of mitram, the ability to invoke and maintain close alliances. And this explains Mitra's sacrificial wish to establish friendship, friendships in all realms which is part of the certain type of love that Mitra represents. Mi, mi representing union and Tra being sort of an instrument of that union. Uh, how I can think of it is, you know, for example, Aryaman tends to be really uh, depicting family relations and being close with your brother, your father, your sister, your mother, your wife, your husband, cousins, etc. Mitra is uh, the union through friendship, of close friendship. Like, for example, I could be close with my father because he's my father, but I could also close to be close with my father because we both like rock music. We laugh to the same timber of humor and jokes. That's a Mitra combination, the enjoyment of two spirits in aesthetic harmony with each other. Those are my own words. I'm going to stick to my text <laughs> to maintain 
that integrity. But I'm glad I got to mention that thought. So Mitra has a sacrificial wish in the Vedas to establish friendship in all realms. And this little quote now comes from the Taittiriya Brahmana. It reads, Mitra desired, may I conquer the establishment of friendship in these worlds. He offered that well-known sacrificial path to Mitra, i.e. to himself, and to the Anuradhas who are his nakshatra. Consequently, he conquered the establishment of friendship in these worlds. He indeed conquers the establishment of friendship in these worlds, he who offers that oblation and who thus knows it. So, on this occasion, after the chief oblation, he, the sacrificer, offers the additional oblations, saying, To Mitra, Swaha, to the Anuradhas, Swaha, to the establishment of friendship, Svaha, to conquest, Svaha. So that's what the sacrificer, the person doing this, this yagna, would be saying in order to bring about the, the establishment of friendship. Again, that comes from Taittiriya Brahmana, book three. Looks like it's verse one, or uh, chapter one, section five. Some of these things have various types of sections. But that comes from Book 3 of the Taittiriya Brahmana. Now, it would be a grave injustice to limit Mitra's range of influence to just comradeship. To appreciate all that he has to offer, one must consider the values and ethics that promote good relationships. For starters, such relationships require that one honors reciprocal agreements, whether these are based on a verbal exchange, a handshake pledge, or a contractual promise. As the Lord of Oaths, according to the Taittiriya Brahmana, Mitra governs all such agreements. He who, when a contest is joined, desires an agreement should offer to Mitra, Verily, he brings himself into harmony with his friend. That comes from the Taittiriya Samhita. Mitra is paired with Varuna. In the ancient symbolic gesture of touching water, Varuna, while taking a solemn oath, it's Mitra. So that's apparently a very old symbolic gesture. If you're going to make an oath, you touch water, and you're connecting Varuna to Mitra. Very interesting. Goodwill is also essential in relationships. This is Mitra's most profound, most distinguished feature. It's goodwill. And this is one is credited for his nearly spotless reputation, suggested by the epithet Putadaksha, pure or noble-minded. His pure state of mind represents the absence of hostility, animosity, or jealousy. It is also the foundation for truth in speech, Mitra's other recognized attribute. Many of the divine forces are equipped for combat, always. Rudra has his quiver of arrows, Indra touts a thousand-edged thunderbolt, and Varuna holds his many-fettered net, just to name a few. Now, guided by ahimsa, nonviolence, cordial Mitra has little need for combat armor or warlike arsenals. He is also free of battle wounds and of bodily disfigurements. To quote, uh, let me check, Shatapata Brahmana. Uh, to quote the Shatapata Brahmana, for Mitra injures no one, nor does anyone injure Mitra. Neither a kusa stalk nor a thorn pricks him, nor has he any scar, for Mitra is everyone's friend. Now, despite his high status and over 400 laudations in the verses of the Rig Veda, Mitra has but a single hymn to his soul dedication. 
cognized by Rishi Vishvamitra. This sukta praises Mitra for his never closing eyes. Mitra beholdeth men with eyes that close not. That's Rig Veda Mandala 3. And elsewhere we hear from the Taittiriya Samhita that Mitra regardeth men with an unwinking eye. Ever watchful over the gods and mortals, Mitra and his unwinking eyes neutralize and appease dangerous situations. For example, Bhagha is blinded when casting his eyes upon the sacrificial Prashitra, Prajapati's injured part. Later, he is granted the ability to safely view the offerings through the eyes of Mitra. Uh, there is a reference to this in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 4, Chapter 7. There's also a reference this to our video that we did talking about Prajapati, the god of Rohini. Now, as a result, the sacrificial protocol of gazing upon a person or object with the eye of Mitra evolved. By doing so, the person transmits the benignity, friendliness, and benevolence inherent in Mitra, for the eye of that god is free from evil, kind and auspicious. For this reason, when gazing upon the Prashitra, even priests do so with the eye of Mitra. Lest Mitra appear as a god without frailties, the Shatapata Brahmana recounts two occasions that he breaches his own decree of Ahimsa. So this is two moments when Mitra had to not be so nice guy, gentle. According to the first legend, out of fear of exclusion from the sacrifice, Mitra agrees to assist the gods in, slaying, in the slaying of demon Vritra. Now, this comes from Shatapata Brahmana. Now, when the gods slew Vritra, they said to Mitra, Thou also slayest. But he liked it not and said, Surely I am everyone's friend. Mitra. Being no friend, I shall become an enemy, or other than Mitra, which is described as Amitra. When you put an A in front of any word, it makes it like it's opposite. So I would have to be Amitra at that point. Then we shall, ex then we shall exclude thee from the sacrifice. Uh, so the gods were saying, we'll have to exclude you from the sacrifice if you're not going to slay Vritra. And then said Mitra, very well, I too will slay. When push comes to shove, seemingly immaculate Mitra puts aside his pristine code of ethics in this moment. It's interesting. I mean, it seems to me Mitra, all the gods were going against Vritra, the devil, the demon thing at the time. So it makes, mm, it's, it's interesting. I'm going to keep reading. <laughs> now, in the second Shatapata Brahmana story, <clears throat> the goddess Sri Lakshmi is birthed from Prajapati's fervid heat, his, tam his tapas. So resplendent is Sri Lakshmi that ten gods desire her stellar qualities for themselves. Although not a particularly be honorable... At, at, excuse me. Although not a particularly honorable notion, they make plans to kill her for just such a purpose. After reprimanding the gods, Prajapati agrees that each may abstract from the goddess a single creative faculty most desired. To this day, the devatas remain renowned for those qualities chosen, including Mitra for his honorable rank. Agni then took her food, Soma, her royal power, Varuna, her universal sovereignty, Mitra, her noble rank, Indra, her power, Prahaspati, 
her holy luster. Savitri, her dominion. Pushan, her wealth. Sarasvati, her prosperity. And Tvastri, her beautiful forms. It's an interesting, interesting metaphor there. All of these gods, these devatas, have these good qualities that essentially comes from Sri Lakshmi. Now, featured in only a handful of Puranic legends, Mitra retires from the mainstream pantheon of gods in the post-Vedic period. One such surviving legend has its origin in the Rigvedic Shukta, extolling the birth of Rishi Vashishta. Recounted here is the time Mitra and Varuna set eyes upon the lovely Apsaras, Ush Urvasi. Duly agitated, they spill their seed, from which Vasishta is birthed. Born from their love for Urvasi, Vasishta thou, priest, art son of Varuna and Mitra. As a fallen drop in heavenly fervor, all the gods laid thee on Lout's blossom, on a Lout's blossom. That's Rig Veda, Mandalith 7. Now, Vasishta, the seer of Rig Veda, Mandala 7, cognized many of the hymns dedicated to his parents, the Devatadvandva, Mitra Varuna. Embellishing upon this tale, the Srimad Bhagavata explains how Vasishta's first incarnation comes to a tragic end. Vasishta curses King Nimi that he will die for conducting a yagna in his absence. Retaliating, the, ki the king curses the same back onto Vasishta, resulting in the sage's death. Vasishta's soul departs his body, but soon enters the semen of Mitra and Varuna. From here, the Rig Vedic storyline is followed. Infatuated with Urvasi, Mitra and Varuna accidentally spill their vital seeds into an earthen pot. Moments later, Vasishta is birthed and given the appellation Maitra Varuni. From this same earthen pot, Rishi Agastya is also birthed, according to the Srimad Bhagavatam. Cool. Now, the semen of a god is most significant for it holds the god's genetic code. Mitra and Varuna pass down their combined divinity to Vasishta. Given his exalted lineage, it's little surprise that Vasishta is a Sapta Rishi of the current Vaishvasvata Manvantara and Purohita to Sri Rama. Now, there's a a little footnote that says Vasishta's wife is Arundhati, who is the reincarnated soul of Prajapati's daughter, Sandhya. You can find more about that in the chapter on Prajapati. Uh, that's the, the deity of Rohini. Vasishta is also grandfather to Parashara, and raises this sage when his father is killed by a demon. Parashara cognized the Brihat Parashara Hora Shastra, an ancient Jyotisha Shastra. Now, the Puranic Mitra, we know the Puranas were a later manifestation of Vedic literature, for better and for worse. A lot of people say the Purana is not as truly Vedic. The Puranic Mitra surfaces once again at Kumara's legendary investiture ceremony. Kumara, also known as Kartikeya, is the legendary son of Agni and Shiva. You can find more about that in the chapter on Kritika and Agni. During this celebratory occasion, the gods bestow to, to Kumara's... Sorry. During this celebratory occasion, the gods bestow to Kumara sons who possess their own innate faculties. Mitra gave unto the high-souled Kumara 
two illustrious companions named Survrata, strict, which means strict and observing oaths, and Satyasandha, that means keeping one's agreement or promise. Companion Varuna gave him Kumara, Kasa, which means devourer, and Atikasa, the great devourer, of great might and possessed of mouths like those of whales. And that actually comes from the Mahabharata, Book 9, Section XLV. I'm not sure what an L would be. The Roman numerals, that is, XLV. So that is the biggest chunk applicable to Mitra here. Now, here... Uh, there's a big chunk dedicated next to Varuna and Shatabisha. Now, we're, we'll, you, you can read more about that in the Shatabisha chapter. Now we're coming into the Maitra Varuna priest. And there's a whole chapter dedicated specifically to this. With over a third of the Rig Vedic Devatadvandva suktas, dedicated to Mitra Varuna. No other duo is more frequently beseeched. Not Indragni, not Agni Soma, not Jyava Prithvi, or Usha Sanakta. Inseparable devatas of moral conduct, Mitra Satya, truth, and Varuna Dharmapati, guardian of order work hand in glove to ensure the maintenance of universal laws. Now, we do get a little footnote here. And it says, during the Abhishesaniya, Abhishesaniya, the royal inauguration ceremony, Satya and Dharmapati are appellations used for Mitra and Varuna, respectively. For Mitra, Satya, the true, he then prepares the, there is prepared a pap of Namba seed. Thereby Mitra, the true, quickens him for the Brahman. For Varuna Dharmapati, the lord of the law, it, there is prepared a Varuna pap of barley. Thereby Varuna, the lord of the law, makes him lord of the law, the sacrificer. And that truly is the supreme state when one is lord of the law. For whosoever attains to the supreme state, to him they come in matters of law. Therefore, to Varuna Dharmapati. That's Shatapata Brahmana. So, ultimately, Mitra Satya is the bearer of truth, and Varuna Dharmapati is the guardian of order and Dharma. Work hand in glove to ensure the maintenance of universal laws. They are aptly contrasted in the Brahmanas as the softly waning, the gentle Mitra, and the fiercely waxing, wrathful Varuna in the sacrificial fire, or as the sacrificial fire. So I'll, I'll say that again. Mitra and Varuna are contrasted in the Brahmanas as Mitra being the gentle waning fire and the Varuna is considered the fiercely waxing, wrathful aspect of the sacrificial fire. Elsewhere, these are the dangerous form of the fire, Varuna, which also has a Mitra form in that men who make friends with him, the fire, may sit near him, though his touch be dangerous. And that comes from the Aitareya Brahmana. <clears throat> now, at the early morning Soma offering, three sets of Devatadvandvas are beckoned to take partake of the Soma draft. Of course, if you've been uh, watching this whole series, you'll know, you, you might have learned that the Soma Yagna ceremony, this great sacrificial ceremony, that was done in ancient, very ancient times, Vedic times, 
where uh, a whole ceremonial procession follows, the gods are invoked, and the whole ceremony is, is filled with symbolism that all resonates with the nakshatras. And essentially, the knowledge of all the nakshatras is contained in this Soma Yajna. So it's a very important knowledge container as well as a legitimate sacrifice ceremony, which can have magical properties to it. So at the early morning Soma offering, three sets of Devatadvandvas, that's the combined gods, are beckoned to partake of the Soma draft. First are Indra Vayu, then Mitra Varuna, and lastly the Ashvani Kumaras. This is the this what's happening here that we're reading about is the very beginning of the Rig Vedas and what they mean and what the what the Rig Vedas represent in a very profound way. I know this from reading uh, The Secret of the Vedas by Sri Aurobindo. I've, I haven't read all of it, but I've read uh, pretty much at this point in my life up to the Mitra Varuna chapter, and I'm, I'm in a bit in that chapter. I digress. Behind every Brahmanic rite, ritual, or mantra is a tale of its origin and meaning. How Mitra Varuna became co-participants in the morning Soma draft is explaining is explained in the following Shatapata Brahmana passage. Mitra is the priesthood, the Brahmin, and Varuna is the nobility, the Kshatriya, the ruling warrior class. And the priesthood is the conceiver of actions, and the noble is the doer of actions. That's the Brahmins conceive action and Kshatriya, the warriors, do the action. Now in the beginning, these two, the priesthood and the nobility, were separate. Then, at that time, Mitra, the priesthood, could stand without Varuna, the nobility. But not Varuna, the nobility, without Mitra, the priesthood. So... There were Brahmins who were there who could survive without the warrior class. But the warrior class has never been able to survive or have meaning or purpose or direction without the Brahmin class. Whatever deed Varuna did, unsped by Mitra, meaning unsupported by truthful thoughts and speech, the priesthood therein, forsooth, he succeeded not. So whatever Varuna, the ruling class, the Kshatriyas, the kings, if they did something that was not in alignment with the Brahmins, it would not succeed. It would lose its, it would be unsped. Varuna, the nobility, then called upon Mitra, the priesthood, saying, Turn thou unto me that we may unite. I will place thee foremost, sped by thee. I will do your deeds. So be it, replied Mitra. So the two united, and therefrom resulted that Soma Graha cup to Mitra Varuna. And that comes from the Shatapata Brahmana. Cool story, very interesting. Suitably stated, a king possesses vast powers of authority. Hence, it is imperative that he have purity of mind. With purity of mind follows purity of action. These dual functions are represented by Mitra Varuna and incorporated into the function of the Maitra Varuna priest. In ceremonies such as Rajasuya, the presence of the Maitra Varuna priest is required for two purposes. Firstly, he serves as commander of the ceremony ensuring the proper performance of all sacrificial actions. This reflects Varuna's role of maintaining right action. 
Of equal importance is his responsibility for proper allocation of mantras amongst the priests. This ensures proper speech and is represented by Mitra. So Mitra is the one who is ensuring this proper speech and this Brahmin priest side of the actions directed through the Maitra Varuna priest. The sacrificial object of the Maitra Varuna is the staff, the Tanda, believed to bestow authority upon the priest. Minkowski, in his book Priesthood in Ancient India, a study of the Maitra Varuni priest, Minkowski explains, the sense of Danda in Vedic literature includes prominently the meaning of weapon. And indeed, Danda in later times comes to be the technical term for the system of punishment of criminals administered by the king. And it's interesting that there was a time in India, a very, it's cool to think about that the ruling classes, there's much said in these times about how religion and sh state shouldn't necessarily be married. Uh, but at this time, for better or worse, there was a Brahma, Brahmanic force that was superior to and superseded the Kshatriya kingship and ruling classes. It wasn't, you know, government was always predisposed to the instruction of the seers, healers, of the the priesthood and the tradition, the Brahmanic traditions, uh, which is very interesting, very psychedelic, and cool to hear about. So everybody, uh, this has been my video today. I'm going to have to call this person back. But this has been our video today, discussing Mitra as it is portrayed in the Vedas, Mitra being the lord of Anuradha Nakshatra. Now, if you want to know a little bit more about the native who has important planets or the moon or Lagna in the sign of Anuradha, sorry, my phone's distracting me. If you want to know more about the Anuradha native, please feel free to check out the video that I've already done discussing the Anuradha native and the nature of that native. Uh, it goes through the Taittiriya Brahmana and discusses the character qualities that are seen from that. But I'm glad to be sharing and discussing and learning about the gods of the Vedas through this series. I hope you're enjoying it as well. Please feel free to let me know any questions, any comments, and I'll always do my best to answer. I'm Dustin Cormier for How to Rock Astrology. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you to the author Radha for her wonderful research done on the depth of the Vedas. Keep your eyes peeled, folks. I always got more stuff coming out. Thanks so much for watching. Take care.